Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, let's continue on with animals part one, maybe C, somewhere in there. Um, either way, what we're talking about today, um, we're continuing on with our animals that are diploblastic. Um, last time we finished with the phylum Nideria, and in hindsight, had I uh, been smarter than I am, I probably would have added this last group. Um, so keep in mind that we we're talking about the class Anthozoa and the Cubozoans, all in the phylum Nideria that are diploblastic organisms, which means they have two tissue layers. They have ectoderm and they have endoderm. They do not have mesoderm. Uh, they have a tissue level layer of organization. And the tenophores, although a different phyla, are similar to the Nideerians, but again, a different phyla. These are called comb jellies. Uh, they're the largest animals known to move uh, using only cilia. And they don't have nematocysts, uh, so they don't have the stinging uh, structures that you find in Nideerians, um, but they do have these tentacles. Uh, and on the tentacles, they have these adhesive cells called coloblasts. And the coloblasts are sort of sticky and they use them to capture prey. But again, they're also diploblastic, two tissue layers, ectoderm and endoderm only. Um, and they move using these cilia that they have on these comb plates that are along the body here like this. Um, so that's the phylum Nideria. Now the next group we get into uh, is the phylum Platyhelminthes. And the Platyhelminthes are also called the flat worms. Uh, Platy has something to do with flat and Helminthes means head. So these are the flat headed worms and the rest of the body is flat also. And the Platyhelminthes are the first group that we see that are triploblastic. And I think pretty much from here on out, everything's gonna be triploblastic and they're going to have three tissue layers, ectoderm and endoderm, but they're also going to have mesoderm. They are aceliomates, and I think we mentioned this before, but that means that they have no body cavity. The um, ectoderm, between the ectoderm and the endoderm that makes the intestines is solid mesoderm, the red colored tissue in the drawing, and that means that they um, have three tissue layers, but they have no body cavity or space uh, in there. Um, for digestion, they have a gastrovascular cavity, which is inside the endoderm. So if you were to go up into the intestines, um, the space inside there is the digestive tract. We call that a gastrovascular cavity because in animals such as the platyhelminthes, or in animals like the Nideerians, uh, the mouth where the food goes in and gets digested also serves as the anus because food comes out that way. So we'll later on talk about an alimentary canal where food goes in through the mouth and comes out a different end, like as what happens in humans. But in some animals, the digestive system early on at least is kind of simplistic and food goes in one hole gets digested and it comes out that same hole so anyway that's called a gastrovascular cavity and there are many different classes within the phylum uh, platyhelminthes so we'll go through a couple of these here the first one is the class turbularia um, these are mostly free living worms most of them are marine um, there's a couple that live on land and they are these big flat worms. Again, many of them in the ocean, often with bright colors. Um, they're the, one of the first groups to show what's called cephalization. Cephalization is a sort of body design concept where what we see evolutionary, evolutionarily is that a lot of things are moving towards a head region. So sensory um, and feeding types of things are all being moved to a head region. In a worm such as this, if someone says, hey, you know, catch this thing, but be careful, grab it by the head so it doesn't bite you, kind of like a snake, you can clearly see that there's sort of a head region. Whereas on an Iderian, like on a, um, on a sea anemone, 
where the head is is kind of like there's no head region on it. It's uh, or a sponge, you know, sponge doesn't have a head really on it. But we're starting to see evolutionarily this idea of things being moved evolutionarily towards a head region. They also have the gastrovascular cavity we mentioned before. And the flatworms are very well known for their ability to regenerate body parts. Um, so there are some pretty interesting studies with the turbellarians uh, where they do things like cut the head in half and the worm can grow two new heads. So their ability to regenerate body parts is quite exceptional. Uh, here's another turbellarian here. Uh, it's on the person's hand uh, just to show you sort of size reference of it. Sometimes I like to say it's a parasite and they pulled it out and everyone gets freaked out by it, but it's not. This is just a free living one. And this is one we have in class uh, that we look at called Dugesia. It has these little um, chemosensory oracle earbud sort of things sticking off of it. They're called oracles and they're used for chemosensation and it has these eye spots on it and you can see the pharynx in it. The Dugesia is the genus of it and you don't need to worry about that one uh, there. You just need to know phylum and class on this particular one. Okay, then we have the Monogenia and these are fish parasites. Uh, they have one host um, and you find that's the term mono one genia one parasitic or one host and again they're fish parasites so if you study fish um, you might know more about these that's kind of all we do in bio 2 about is that particular one then we have the class trematoda and i'm going to go over the specific one in a minute trematodes are what we call endoparasitic flukes, and they tend to have two hosts. And what you find is that the um, they have this interesting sort of, um, since they're parasites, parasites have all these weird adaptations to being parasites. So one of the things that you find, and originally when they were discovered, it was thought that these were like two different species. But what you find is that you have this male, and then, and then the female looks totally different and the male has this groove on its body in here and the female lives inside that groove so there are two individuals one's male one's female uh, but they live together and the female lives actually inside the male um, and that happens there's several animals that do that that are two different sexes but they operate and live together. So we'll go into more detail on this particular one. This one is also uh, what we call a blood fluke. This particular one is schistosoma. And this one you do need to know the genus of schistosoma. So we'll go through a bunch of these worms and many of them you do need to know the genus of. Uh, so you need to know that schistosoma is the genus and that the common name is blood fluke. So you need to know both those terms for lecture and for lab. So what happens in this particular one is um, in parts of the world, uh, South America, parts of Africa, West India, uh, mainly tropical areas uh, where the sanitation is not terribly good. That's one thing the United States is very good at is the water that um, has feces in it is separate from the water that you drink and bathe in and that kind of stuff, which sounds simplistic but much of the world doesn't have the infrastructure to accommodate that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, the tropical weather where you have a lot of mixing and a lot of rain in the water, that makes it very difficult to separate those two sort of processes. But in this particular case, what happens is um, person's infected and goes to the bathroom and the feces washes into a lake or pond or stream and that's where the eggs develop into these myricidia larvae that come out of the human and then they burrow into this snail here they get into the snail they develop into the snail and they come out of the snail as the sericaria larva and the circaria larva then is a free swimming larva that burrows into the skin in your foot and you know a little cut on your skin will burrow in and get back inside your body and that's how it completes uh, the life cycle of schistosoma. Um, this one here is a little bit different. This one's called Clonorchis. And once again, you need to know the genus of Clonorchis and the common name liver fluke. This particular one 
comes from eating raw fish. And you eat the raw fish, um, and if it's infected with the fluke, then what ends up happening is you, uh, you eat the larva and it develops inside of you. And in this particular case, um, it, you get it from the fish. Um, it also has a intermediate host in the snail, uh, but you're getting it directly by eating the fish. You don't have to actually, um, in this case, the second host is the fish. Um, and you end up getting it by eating raw fish. One of the jokes I make in class is um, like, you know, you, you don't have to worry because who would eat raw fish? And then we got on the subject of sushi. And um, eventually I, I like to ask, you know, do you think I eat sushi? And most of the class says no, like, because I tell this story. But in fact, I do. The difference is I don't eat all you can eat sushi for $4. Um, so there, there's an economic price point fish is um, on the brink of uh, because of the overfishing uh, fish is on the brink of like extinction worldwide most species so economically fish is supposed to be expensive so sushi is expensive eating good sushi is expensive if it has fish in it so eating fish that's very inexpensive, it makes me question that. So I don't make my own sushi. Um, I go and I eat. I've never been sick on eating um, expensive sushi, at least, you know, relatively speaking. But I don't eat all you can eat $4 sushi um, unless it's something like California rolls or with no fish in it. It's a different game. But anyway, um, that's how you get it by eating raw fish that is not sushi grade fish that's not, you know, regulated and carefully uh, prepared. And uh, there's, there's very, you know, I, I don't know all the factors that go into it, but I know economically it's not possible. It just doesn't make sense, at least here in the United States, that you could eat fish for all you could eat fish for $4. Uh, I have my doubts. I could be wrong, but I'm not sick. And so I take those odds. Anyway, that ends up over a long period of time causing cirrhosis and liver damage. I should also point out that when we talk about uh, these worm infections, um, they are very common in certain parts of the world. In the United States, you don't see, um, you, you, we learn these things are very much like psychology. You start to get a little paranoid that maybe you have every one of these worms and you don't, uh, most likely. Uh, the odds that you have any of these particular worms if you live in the United States, it's pretty low. There are places in the world where worm infections are, are systemic and worldwide. Um, most of them can be easily treated with medication, uh, but you probably, if you just ate sushi one day at a restaurant in California, you probably don't have a worm infection. So you should just keep that in mind, put it in perspective with things, okay? The next one is called swimmer's dermatitis. This is also a trematode. And this particular one, you don't need to know the genus. We'll just call it from the skin condition you get. And what happens is if you're swimming in a, uh, a pond uh, or a lake somewhere, natural body of water uh, where there are birds around, um, the larva in this particular case, it burrows into your skin. But uh, the understanding is your body temperature is not high enough for it to complete its life cycle. So you get this sort of red rash, um, but it doesn't, um, you're, you're not the right host for it. So it ends up um, eventually going away. It's probably something you put cream or something on your skin to relieve the discomfort of it, but um, not, you're not the right host in this particular case. Okay, the next group is the class Cestoidea, and these are the endoparasitic tapeworms, of which there's a bunch of them. And uh, basically, almost each species of animals has um, its own kind of tapeworm. And they have these repeated body segments called proglottids. And they have this head here that has, uh, we call it a scolex, and it has hooks and suckers on it. And so these are the hooks here and this thing sort of 
grabs onto the side of your intestines and, and hangs on inside. And then the long tapeworm part, like a ribbon, absorbs the nutrients. And all these little repeating proglottids, these repeating sections, um, can reproduce and make a whole new tapeworm. So they are hermaphrodites with male and female parts in both parts uh, on the same worm in each proglottid. So if it breaks apart, um, any of the proglottids essentially is a little reproductive package to produce a whole new tapeworm. And like I said, many animals have their own tapeworm. Um, the only thing I want you to know here is the genus Tinea, um, or Tinea. And this particular one's called Tinea saginata. It's a beef tapeworm. So as long as you know what a tapeworm is and you know this genus Tinea, that's fine. You don't need to know the species part for them. Um, for no particular reason, I just don't do it. But, but cows, for example, have tapeworms. And pigs have a different tapeworm, different species of them, solium. And again, you don't need to know the species part. So as long as you know that that word tapeworm goes along with the genus Tinea. So Tinea or Tinea, and then we could just call it SP for species, which means there's a bunch of them. Now, this one is a fish tapeworm, different genus. Um, you don't have to worry about the um, species part, but just know that this genus uh, di Diphylobothrium, it's a hard one to say. Diphylobothrium is a fish tapeworm. And then this one you don't need to know at all. Um, the idea here is the diplidium. There's also a tinea um, species, but these are dog tapeworms. And we often in class make a joke that because you eat this, if you eat a beef tapeworm, you get a beef tapeworm as a human infection. If you eat undercooked pork, you can get pork tapeworm. So there's a joke that you eat undercooked dog, then you get this tapeworm. Um, you can get tapeworms from dogs by ingesting a flea if the dog was infected, but it's kind of, uh, it's pretty rare that humans get dog tapeworms. Um, it can be done, uh, but it's a joke that you're eating undercooked dog. I mean, people eat everything in different parts of the world, but um, eating dogs is uh, probably pretty uncommon. You, you definitely get tapeworms in more common ways. So that's more of a joke than anything. Okay. And kinococcus is the next one. And kinococcus causes what's called a unilocular hydatid, which is a type of cyst. And so what happens in this case, um, there's normally this parasitic route in which what happens is uh, you have uh, animals like sheep and goats and things of that sort that are eating grass. They get infected with this host and then predatory things like wolves and wild dogs would eat these animals and that would complete the life cycle. But uh, sometimes when humans eat these infected animals, um, if, the, if they're infected and the meat is not cooked all the way thoroughly and you get the parasite, um, the parasite can't complete its life cycle in you, but instead it causes a cyst like in a part of your liver or in your heart. And it causes this big sort of cyst to develop. And eventually over time it can cause organ damage. Okay. Now, all of those that we talked about there are called aceliomates. Remember, they have uh, ectoderm, they have endoderm, they have mesoderm, but the mesoderm is a solid mesoderm material that, that spans all the way from the endoderm to the ectoderm. So what we're going into now is what we call a different body design called the pseudosilomate. So these have a space, a body cavity, and the, the advantage of having this kind of body cavity is that you can do things in that. You can, you can, you have the space to grow things like organs. Like if a, if a species reproduces seasonally and it grows a bunch of eggs or a bunch of sperm, and then it doesn't later on, it can use that space to grow internally. 
Um, one of the reasons, for example, in humans uh, at Thanksgiving, when you can eat so much and, and, and expand your stomach uh, to this incredible level is you have some space in between there between the organs and you can push into that space and use it as an example. Um, and then when the stomach shrinks, those organs can kind of push back. There's a little bit of space in between them. So that's called a pseudo salome. Now I should say in the case of like humans, it's a true celome. It's surrounded by mesoderm on all sides. In this case, what I'm talking about is a, what they call a fake body cavity because it's not surrounded by mesoderm on all sides, but it gives you some of the advantage of it. You can store nutrients in there. It can be used for movement, uh, space for organ development also serves as a hydrostatic, hydrostatic skeleton because you can press on it and you can move say body segments and pieces of it relative to the pressure you're putting on that space. So the first group we'll talk about is the phylum rotifera. Uh, these are mostly a freshwater organism. Uh, they have a ring of cilia that you can see there that goes around the mouth and they have uh, jaws uh, so they can, they can bite and chew on things. They're small microscopic, but they're a predatory animal that hunts other small things in say pond water. Um, and they have a complete alimentary canal, which means that they, I don't know exactly where it is, but essentially there's a mouth that goes through an intestine kind of thing and it comes out somewhere. So it's a complete digestive tract where food comes in one way and goes out through the anus. They're also an example of parthenogenesis. Uh, parthenogenesis is often referred to as what they call the virgin birth. And the idea here is that uh, there are certain animals that are female that can, even though they're female animals and reproduce sexually with sperm and eggs, they can, under certain conditions, certain conditions, certain animals can produce viable offspring without sexual reproduction. So essentially they um, have eggs that instead of being haploid, uh, and there's different mechanisms by which it happens, but essentially the egg can develop into not just an egg, but into a whole new individual that is a type of clone relative to the mother. And there are many different versions of it, but uh, that's what parthenogenesis means. So it's like, it's an animal that normally reproduces sexually, but under certain scenarios has this sort of asexual reproduction that mimics sort of the, it sort of, it, it sort of takes over what would happen during sexual reproduction. Okay. Now the next group are called the lophophorate phyla and there are several groups in the lophophorate phyla, uh, the ectoprocta, the pheronids and the brachiopods and the lophophorate phyla have in common this structure called the lophophore, which is these feeding tentacles here. Uh, there are three different groups of them. Uh, these are the lamp shells down here. These are the pheronids and these are the ectoprox and they are all their own individual uh, pseudosalomate organisms with this feeding structure. They're all, as far as I know, located in the ocean and um, there's not a terribly large amount of information we know about them relative, relative to other um, species at least. Okay. The next group are the Nermatia and the Nermatia are also called the proboscis worms. They have a closed circulatory system, which is like ours, which means the blood remains inside blood vessels as it travels through the body. We'll talk about this more later on versus an open circulatory system where it sort of sloshes around in a space. So this allows for more of a direct movement of blood from one part of the body to others. This is like what we have in us. As I said, they also have a complete digestive tract like ours, where there's a mouth on one end and an anus on another. And they have a proboscis and I can't see it on this one, but a proboscis is like a, it's like a mouth. Um, and they, they can bite. Uh, so the Nermatia are uh, found in uh, marine environments. And most people, when you think about a worm, you don't think a worm could do all that much to you, but these can bite. They have a significant, um, this proboscis can come out 
and actually take a bite, uh, a, a chunk out of you or out of another animal. Okay, the next is the nematode worms. And we're learning more and more about uh, nematode worms uh, as we develop our knowledge of microbiology. But essentially, we think there's probably a nematode worm for just about every species, one or more, that lives on the planet. There are probably more nematode worms than there are most species, but they're not yet identified. Right now, the most number of species we have of anything are in um, beetles. Um, but we've been studying them longer. So the nematodes are, are usually fairly small, unsegmented, and they have tapered ends on the body like that. Um, so this is the head region here, and that's where the tail would be. Also have a complete alimentary canal. And they're, they're in, they're, they, they, they occupy every kind of niche you could imagine. So many of them are decomposers that are found in soil and grass and things of that sort. Some are agricultural pests. Um, and many of the ones we'll talk about at least are parasites. So the first one here is this scary looking one um, called Encyclostoma. And Encyclostoma, again, you need to know the genus and the common name, hookworm. Uh, hookworms live, uh, they come from dogs and other animals like that. They're in the feces. And if you walk around barefoot on the grass and there's a dog that had been there that had defecated and they had hookworms in it, the hookworms could burrow into your skin and you could have a hookworm infection. Again, in the United States, probably not very common. We do a pretty good job of uh, having certain rules and regulations on what you're supposed to do with your cats and dogs and things of that sort. And so it's not totally chaotic all the time, you hope. But anyway, encyclostoma. The next one is enterobius, which are pinworms. And pinworms um, are, are actually a fairly common thing in humans, um, in children at least, um, because children get infected with them and it'll spread through, say, a preschool or elementary school. And what happens is the pinworms are in your digestive tract. The female comes out at night, lays the eggs on their rectum, and a kid will, um, you know, scratch his butt or her butt, and then we'll have the eggs underneath on their skin and under their fingernails. And then when they go to school and talk to their other friends and touch each other, it can pass from kid to kid to kid. And that's how you get pinworms. Uh, the next is a very interesting worm. It's called a scirus, And it's actually fairly large. You can see down here that this is around maybe three or four centimeters, I believe. So these, these worms get fairly big. Um, you know, if you have a, let's say that's a foot across there, you know, just for relative size, right? So if that's a foot, then six inches is right about there. So these worms are somewhere around, uh, I'm guessing like five to seven centimeters, somewhere in there. Um, so they're maybe five to 10 centimeters. Anyway, there you can see them. You know, just trying to think about seeing them in lab and, and sort of guessing on size. Um, they're around four inches or so. I'm going to look that up to be more precise, but they're fairly big. They're, they're, they're not uh, insignificantly small. You can see them without a microscope and a large portion of the world. You know, you're talking like maybe two billion people or 1.5 billion people. Uh, at a time uh, are infected with a scarus worm. So it's one of the most widespread worm infections on the planet. Again, not common in the United States, but other parts of the world, it is endemic where almost, you know, lots and lots of people have it. Um, and they get big and it's a significant problem. Okay, <clears throat> next is the trichinella. Uh, trichinella, again, you need to know the genus trichinella and we call this a trichnid worm. Um, actually, I should go back. Ascaris, of course, you need to know the genus Ascaris just in case that wasn't obvious. Uh, this is trichinella, and trichinella you get by in eating infected pork. So if you have uh, pork chops and you don't cook it all the way and the meat was infected, you could get the trichnid worm and you would get the trichinella worm by eating 
infected pork. Um, the next one is Wuchereria, and Wuchereria is not a very big worm. Um, it's transferred by the bite of mosquito. But what happens with Wuchereria is it blocks lymphatic vessels. So normally um, when you have your blood pressure pushing your blood through your body, long story short, on this end, coming from your heart, the blood pressure is pretty high and it's pushing fluid out, but you have this resistance, this osmotic pressure pushing fluid back in. And so if you look over on this end, as you move away and come from the arterial side from the heart to the venous side coming back, that blood pressure drops off. It's being reduced as you travel away. Um, but that, that osmotic pressure, the fluid pushing back, uh, stays the same. So you have this system where you're pushing fluid out, but pushing it back in. But you'll notice right here, here's the difference. There's a 10 and there's a seven, which means they're not quite equal, which means you're not getting all the fluid you're pushing out back in. And so the lymphatic system uh, shown in green often that are one-sided, meaning they're, you know, they don't, they don't travel, they only go one direction. That fluid normally goes into the lymphatic system and goes back through your lymph nodes and dumps back into the heart. Well, this is where that worm tends to infect. It infects these lymphatic vessels. And so when you have that, you get this really bad um, form of edema or swelling, and we call it elephantiasis, where the lymphatic vessels are blocked quite often in the axillary regions of a leg or in an arm, and you get this massive swelling uh, because you're not able to circulate that blood. The last worm is the Draconaculus worm, or also called the Guinea worm. Oops, go back. And, oops, let me get my pin. What happened, pin? So anyway, here's my Draconaculus worm here. And this one ends up coming out through the skin. And what people will do in parts of Africa where the worm is sort of common, they'll get a stick and they'll wrap it around the stick and slowly over a couple of days or so pull the worm out. Um, the good news about this worm is that it, it appears to be kind of reasonably easy to stop because in order to get the worm, you have to infect or, or you have to, you have to ingest this small little um, arthropod that is found in the water. And so the idea is that with a particular filter on a, on a straw, you can drink the water and not get infected with this worm. So there's some hope that this worm, Draconaculus, um, will be able to be um, um, driven to sort of a non-human uh, infected state. Um, it will go, I don't know what you call, I'm trying to think of the term you call that. I'll put the word up because I'll think of it later. But anyway, there's a uh, eradicated, that's the word I was looking for. We can eradicate this disease in humans by breaking this chain. So anytime you can break the chain and the life cycle of a parasitic organism, you can stop it from infecting humans. And that's what we're hoping to do on that one. So that's the end of worms. Uh, for these kinds of worms, at least, the pseudosalomate uh, worms. And uh, we'll continue on from there later on. I hope everyone's having a good day and making it through the semester. And um, take care, and I will talk with you soon.